is J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is definitely not one of those cases of from rags to riches. In his case, it was from riches to riches. His father was, well, here's one of the, actually the interesting things. John, excuse me, J.P. Morgan, John Pierpont Morgan, was probably the most powerful man in the United States in the 1890s. And I'm going to give you an example, a particular illustration of how that worked. In 1893, there was one of the recurrent financial panics that the country suffered in the 19th century. There was a panic of 1819, there was a panic of 1837, a panic of 1857, a panic of 73, a panic of 93, a panic of 1907, and so on. And as when the panics coincided with the industrial period, from the Civil War to the end of the 19th century, the panics, I should say, the panics were, the panics were very much what like, ha like what happened in the autumn of 2008, where Wall Street seizes up. People can't get loans. Banks begin to collapse. It's different, but often related to a larger economic depression. Now, the Panic of 73 gave rise to a depression that lasted through the rest of the 1870s. The Panic of 1893 gave rise to a broader depression that lasted until 1896. In the middle of this, J.P. Morgan came to the rescue of the U.S. government. I'll say that again. It's worked because when we get to the present day, it's going to work the other way around. J.P. Morgan came to the rescue of the U.S. Treasury. It happened this way. By statute and by Wall Street custom, the United States needed to have $100 million in gold in reserve, on hand, because at the time, the United States was on a de facto gold standard. People who held dollars and got nervous about the fate of the dollar could exchange their dollars for gold if they wanted to. Hand in the dollars at the local sub-treasury out of the branch of the treasury, and the treasury would give them gold if they wanted. Now, for most Americans in domestic enterprises, in domestic economic activities, they didn't want to do this because they bought and sold in dollars. But it was critical for importers and exporters and foreigners who had dollars in their holdings. Because if you were a London investor, you couldn't do anything with dollars. You needed British pounds, or gold would work. Gold was the international currency. So after the Panic of 1893, international holders of dollars began to get nervous. And when people get nervous, they flee from insubstantial forms of money to the more substantial forms. And at the time, there was nothing more substantial than gold. Gold is in vogue again. There are all sorts of people who think gold is what people should hang on to, today even. Well, it was definitely the case in the 1890s. And so as a result of this pressure, the U.S. Treasury's gold supply began to dwindle. And in the latter part of 1894, it crashed through the $100 million floor and kept going down. Well, this is one of those cases that often happens in the financial industry. Bad news begets worse news. And as the gold supply dwindled, those people who were still holding dollars were wondering, what am I doing holding the dollars? And they tried to redeem them for gold as quickly as they could. And so the descent line got steeper and steeper and steeper. J.P. Morgan, in February 1895, realized that there was only one person in the United States, perhaps one person on Earth, who could rectify the situation, and that was J.P. Morgan himself. Now, J.P. Morgan, like John Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, considered himself a patriot, considered himself doing good work for the American people. And so he didn't want the dollar to collapse. But just as in the case of Rockefeller, just as in the case of Carnegie, doing good for the country would do good for J.P. Morgan. Most of his, the vast majority of his financial holdings were in dollars. If the dollar collapsed, well, his wealth would collapse. So J.P. Morgan took his private railroad car and attached it to a southbound express train. These were in the days before the Holland Tunnel. Any of the under the Hudson tunnels had been dug. And so if you want to travel from New York to Washington, you had to take a ferry across the Hudson River, and then you catch a train uh, in Jersey. And that's what he did. Off he went. President Grover Cleveland was deeply ambivalent about the approach of J.P. Morgan because Cleveland was a president and a member of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party then, as now, was the party less beholden to big capital, 
than was the Republican Party. And although Grover Cleveland was, in the, the terms they used in those days, he was a gold Democrat. He believed in the gold standard. He was financially conservative, but the left wing of the Democratic Party, headed by William Jennings Bryan, believed that J.P. Morgan was the devil incarnate. And for Grover Cleveland to have anything to do with J.P. Morgan would almost certainly consign the gold Democrats to defeat at the national nominating convention the next year, in 1896. So Cleveland wanted to somehow, well, deal with Morgan, but at arm's length. There was good news. When Morgan's train headed south, all of a sudden the run on gold eased. There were spies everywhere. Spies. There were reporters everywhere. And the reporters tracked the movements of J.P. Morgan. The word got out, Morgan is going to Washington. OK. Then the financial markets said, oh, all is well. Morgan's going to Washington. Cleveland read the reports, read the papers. Oh, hey, this is great. I get the advantages of having Morgan come to the rescue without Morgan actually coming to the rescue. So he sends his closest friend on the cabinet to meet J.P. Morgan at Union Station in Washington. And Morgan gets out of his car, and the, the representative of the Cleveland administration says, Mr. Morgan, thank you for coming. We appreciate your public spirit, but the president will not see you. And Morgan says, I have come to Washington to see the president. I will stay until I see the president. Now, Morgan knew perfectly well how the financial markets were gonna res were, would respond to, there were spies in Washington too. And it became clear that Morgan had not gone directly to the White House. Instead, he had gone to the Willard Hotel, where he spent that evening chatting with a few friends and then playing solitaire until 4 o'clock in the morning. How do we know 4 o'clock? There were spies in the hotel. And they could see what time the light went out. He was up again the next morning and dressed for breakfast, dressed, shaved, the whole thing, down at breakfast. He knew something that was of critical importance to the US government, critical importance to the stability of the American dollar, something that the President of the United States did not know. And here's another important element of economic evolution during the Gilded Age. Nobody knew anything. Well, compared to what people know today, nobody knew anything. J.P. Morgan knew more than most people, but the U.S. Treasury had no idea how many people out there had any intentions of redeeming their, their gold bonds and so on. They were operating in the dark. Morgan was operating a little bit more in the light because one, one of the secrets of Morgan's success was his understanding that in a capitalist world, knowledge is worth more than money. Morgan was brought into, Morgan was a banker, basically. And he was brought in to reorganize various corporations. And every time he reorganized a corporation, he said, OK, we'll float you the money. We'll make the merger of the deal reorganization happen. But there's one condition. And that is one of my partners gets to sit on your board of directors. In those days, there was no SEC. There was no reporting requirement. There were no annual statements. Nobody knew how much stock was outstanding in this corporation. Nobody knew what the annual revenues, profits, all any of that stuff was. They were, nobody was required to report it. But Morgan knew because he had somebody sitting on the board of directors. Morgan knew that morning in February 1894 that there was one particular investor who had $10 million in gold bonds that were coming due that day. And he knew that the Treasury had $9 million in gold. More precisely, that the sub-treasury office in New York, which is the critical place, had $9 million. The total Treasury had something like $40 million at the time. And he knew that, as he put it, when he when, while he was drinking his orange juice, the word came from the White House, yes, the president will indeed see you. Because Cleveland could see that the markets were getting nervous again. So he says, sends across word, Mr. Morgan, come in. So Morgan goes over and he lays it out for Cleveland. And he says, Mr. President, you've got to take emergency action. If you don't, the Treasury will be insolvent by this afternoon. And the dollar will be worth nothing. And Cleveland kind of gulped at this. He said, okay, what do you suggest? Cleveland had been thinking in terms of a public bond offering. The government would sell gold bonds, which meant it would sell bonds, uh, it would 
borrow money, the money you would borrow would be gold. And Morgan said, no, that's never going to work. It's going to take too long because it would require authorization from Congress, and Congress was all tied up with things that Congress is always tied up with. Morgan said, Mr. President, I think I've got the answer. There is still on the books a law that was passed during the Civil War that allowed the U.S. President, on his own authority, to sell bonds and borrow gold in exchange. And Mr. President, I believe that you will find it in Section 4100 of the Revised Statutes. And Cleveland turned to his Attorney General, his Treasury Secretary, and said, is that right? They said, well, we'll go see. So they went and they got their copy of the Revised Statute. Actually, Morgan had the number wrong, but the, they found it. Mr. President, you do have that authority. So Cleveland says, okay, Mr. Morgan, what are we going to do? And he says, uh, Morgan says, I and a group that I represent will lend you $100 million in gold, and in exchange you will give, it these, give us these bonds. And the word will get out that you, the, the government has enough gold, and that will save the day. Cleveland was a little bit leery of going into 100 million, seemed like a, a large amount of money in those days. So he said, well, we got a total of 40 million in the Treasury. Let's just top it back up to 100. So let's make it 60. And Morgan says, oh, all right. So, and because Morgan knew that the amount was not critical. What was critical was Morgan's name as co signer for the US Treasury. Because once the word got out that JP Morgan was behind the dollar, then everyone would calm down. That's exactly what happened. And the dollar was saved. And the silver Democrats were outraged. Congress held hearings. J.P. Morgan was hauled before Congress to explain himself. Mr. Morgan, tell us the terms. Tell us the extortionate terms on which you loan this money to the government. And Morgan was quite willing to state everything about the terms of the deal, as he said, up until the time the bonds became my property. I'll tell you what the deal was with the US government. I'll tell you who the investors were. I'll tell you all this. But once they became my property, I'm not telling you a thing. It's my business, my property, it's my business. And Threats of jail could not get him to tell. He went to his grave. And nobody ever knew how much money he made on the deal. Now, he certainly made a lot of money on the deal. Why? Well, because when it looked like the government was going to default, nobody wanted to buy the bonds. And as soon as J.P. Morgan was behind it, everybody wanted to buy the bonds. So he flipped these bonds and made a pretty substantial profit. And he was shocked. He was hurt by the fact that having come to the rescue of the US government, he got nothing but grief from the representatives of the US government. Now, if, let's see, Rockefeller was Gates and Carnegie was Jobs, who was J.P. Morgan? Ben Bernanke. And the reason I say this is the outrage over the fact, again, you might think people would be grateful. No, they were outraged that a great country was beholden to a single individual. And from that point until 1913, which with maybe kind of historic poetic justice or something, maybe just coincidence. No, actually it was more than coincidence. Um, after another financial panic, Morgan was brought again to Washington, and hearings were conducted into what was called the Money Trust. And these were hearings that were leading up to the creation of the Federal Reserve System. Morgan, this time, had to say more, in part because they had a better, uh, it really seemed like prosecuting counsel on the, on the staff of the committee. It was called the Pujo Committee. And Morgan was on the stand for days, and he was getting more and more uncomfortable. He left Washington shortly after that, and he went off on his annual art buying trip to Europe. And he came down with a mysterious illness, and within a week, he was dead. And no one could have, doctors couldn't figure out what killed him, but his friends said that it was that grilling that he got from an ungrateful Congress. 
Well, that ungrateful Congress went on a few months later to create the Federal Reserve System. Now, flash forward to 2008, and I said earlier that J.P. Morgan came to the rescue of the U.S. government. Remember what happened in 2008? The U.S. government came to the rescue of J.P. Morgan, now J.P. Morgan Chase, and all the other big banks, which, well, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow.